this week on the Back Table Podcast. We were traditionally taught that the vestibulectomy made the diameter bigger of the entranceway, but to be honest, it doesn't in a lot of our patients, particularly the null patient. So what we found in order to get the diameter large enough, first of all, they need to be educated on dilators to use starting eight weeks out from the surgery if needed. And the second thing I do is if the pain is up towards the urethra as well. I mean, almost always it's on the lower part between the, in lithotomy, the three and nine o'clock positions. But if it goes up between nine and 12 o'clock or three and 12 o'clock, we do a vestibulectomy of the area. We make a U and then we do V to Ys on the superior part from the inner labium minus on each side. And that makes a larger entranceway diameter. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Back Table OBGYN podcast, your source for all things obstetrics and gynecology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on backtable.com. I'm a guest host, Dr. Jessica Rich. I'm a minimally invasive gynecologist out of South Florida. You can find me on a prior episode as the guest, but today I will be hosting, and I'm very happy to have with me here today, Dr. Hope Hafner. She is the Harold Furlong Professor of Women's Health at the University of Michigan and the past president of the International Society for the Study of Vulvovaginal Disease and the American Society for Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology. She's an OBGYN with special interest in vulvovaginal disease and a fellowship training in GYN pathology. Hope, welcome. Well, thank you. Thanks so much for inviting me to speak with you today. I'm so excited to talk with you today. I was, you know, talking with everyone at Backtable OBGYN about the types of things that I thought might be interesting to have on the podcast. And I said, you know, everybody always needs to know about vulvovaginal disease. And it's one of those areas that is so hard to get information about or that so little of us are really well trained in. And I was wondering who I should talk to. And your name just kept coming up again and again. So tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into your current position and, and your interest in this area. Sure. I started my residency at the University of Michigan and even uh, back to med school when I was there, there were some people that were vulvologists, George Morley, John Gosling. After I finished my residency, I did a gynecologic pathology fellowship from 1991 to 1993. And at that point in time, there was a professor who had a particular interest in vulvovaginal disease. His name was John R.G. Gosling. Dr. Gosling was one of the founding fathers of the International Society for the Study of Vulvovaginal Disease. And we started working together. He was teaching me all about gin path as well as vulvovaginal diseases. And then later, Dr. George Morley, past president of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, another founding father of the ISSVD, said to me, well, listen, why don't you come to a meeting in Quebec for the ISSVD? And that was in the mid-90s. And he wanted me to meet all these vulvovaginal disease specialists. And I happened to watch the lectures and view posters and learn that there were topical steroids that were used for lichen sclerosis instead of testosterone. And that just opened my eyes to this as a career. And I love that you say that you met all of these experts in vulvovaginal disease because I do feel like it's really hard to come by, that there are few and far between of you experts. So I'm, I'm really glad to hear what you have to say because this is a common complaint that we hear from so many of our patients and, and so many of us um, don't have a lot of training in this area. So let's start with kind of the common symptoms or complaints that you hear people come in with. Can you talk about some of the things that you typically come across? Sure. I'd, I'd like to first clarify symptoms versus signs, because often people do mix that up. A symptom is something the patient feels, whereas a sign is something you as a healthcare provider or the patient can see. So some of the symptoms... When we first opened our Center for Vulvar Diseases, I would say 70% to 80% of our patients had vulvodynia. So that's a symptom. 
pain, burning, normal appearing vulva. And I realized quickly that I needed to learn pain management. Now, as the years progressed, it actually changed in that family medicine got interested in researching and treating this patient population. They started seeing the majority of vulvodynia patients that didn't need surgery. And so now what's taken over is a symptom of itching, paritis. We would see in one clinic, if I were seeing patients alone, we would probably see 70% of the patients have lichen sclerosis. But you do need to know that some of these patients with these other conditions have pain too. So you need to know how to treat pain to take care of those conditions. But I would say lichen sclerosis is our most common diagnosis at this point. We also see a lot of high-grade precancers. We see some hidradenitis suppurativa, Paget's disease, all different conditions. So how do you start to kind of group people into these sort of different categories of what you're looking for based on the symptoms and what sort of signs are you looking for? And and how do you start to kind of put that together and, and categorize the issues that people are dealing with? Before a patient actually gets an appointment in our clinic, they fill out an intake survey that is very long, but very helpful for us to put them into a differential diagnosis. For example, some of the providers in our clinics don't operate. Some are family medicine, et cetera. And so those that are family medicine are going to see the patients that don't need surgery, whereas someone comes in with an active Bartholin cyst that we think we might need to marsupialize, they'll see one of the gynecologists that operates. So we have an intake survey. And after we see the intake surveys filled out, they get an appointment appropriate for what they have with who they need to see. And then some of the patients fill these intake surveys out on paper, whereas others do it electronically. And no matter what, whichever way it is, I know what I need to ask them when I go into the room. And I quickly go over the intake survey. And often I know even before I examine the vulva what is in my differential. And then we start the physical exam. And if needed, we go with further testing. I always do a cotton swab test on someone that complains of vulvar pain before I do anything else on them because once you touch the vulva, you've sensitized them to any other touch. I often will do yeast cultures on patients that have itching or burning because certain species of yeast can cause burning. We like to obtain any outside records of path diagnoses. When we first started our Center for Vulvar Diseases, we would ask for the slides to be sent to us for our pathologist to review, but in the cost-effective environment today, we don't do that unless it's somebody that really has a questionable diagnosis or needs surgery, et cetera. You said so much in there, so I wanted to circle back on a couple of things. First is that you have this center that's specifically focusing on the vulvovaginal diseases, and it sounds like it's pretty multidisciplinary. So you have some gynecologists, some family medicine, and was it some pathologists in there as well? Tell us a little bit more about the grouping of your center. We have a variety of providers. We have a nurse that specializes in the vulva. We have two sexual counselors. And they are our clinic. So many of our patients have sexual problems or relationship issues. And they interview the majority of our new patients at their initial visit. If they can't be seen at the initial visit, they do it online with them. As long as in the state of Michigan, you have to have that patient in the same state to do it online. We do work with some dermatopathologists if we have questions. Usually the majority are read by the gynecologic pathologist for the high grade, for example. But if we're getting into some unusual conditions like pemphigus, pemphigoid, we will start with a dermatopathologist. Okay. And then you said you have this pretty comprehensive intake form. And just looking at the intake form, you're able to recognize certain patterns and, and put your differential together. Can you, and I know that this is a this is a big question, but can you tell us some of the most common things that you see, like for the lichen or for other areas? Like what are those couple of things that are you're highlighting on the intake form that are making you lean in one way or the other before you examine somebody? If they're 
itching, if they're scratching, if they've had a biopsy that shows lichen simplex chronicus, we're going to think, oh, they've got the itch scratch itch cycle, which is meaning they itch, though they start to scratch and it feels so good, but after they've scratched, they itch even more and they start going down the tube. If they have a recent atrophy diagnosis, for example, they're in menopause and they have pain with intercourse and they haven't tried any estrogens, just from looking at their intake survey, pain with sex, recent menopausal, we're going to think about doing something that is estrogen forming to help them like a Vagifem suppository or other estrogen suppositories, topical estrogen. Sometimes we'll use systemic estrogen dependent on the age and other conditions with the patient. Right. And I think that's one of the things that I'm most often surprised about with people with the vulvar and vaginal complaints, how many times they've tried like a million different topical things, but haven't actually tried estrogen. So I think it's always really important to make sure every pretty much everybody's getting some vaginal estrogen at some point. Not everybody, of course, but those people with the genitourinary syndrome of menopause, of course. And then, okay, so then you're coming in, you're starting to examine them. You said that you start with a cotton swab test. So tell me a little bit more about what you mean by that cotton swab test. We keep track of the various points on the vulva that have any potential for pain. So generally, I'll start at the lateral labia majora. And if they have pain there, I'll go down to the thigh and down to the knee even. Sometimes they have pain down there. If I'm in the big toe, that's out of my area. That doesn't even make sense from the pudendal nerve distribution and iliungital genofemoral nerve distributions. But usually we start on the labia majora, superior and inferior. Then we go to the interlabial sulci, then the labia minora. And I tell them as I go, now I'm going to touch here so they're not startled. And then once I've done the labia minora, I spread them gently and I do the inner labia minora, including the vestibule. So I happen to be right-handed. I start the vestibule at the 10 o'clock position in lithotomy. Then I do 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 8 o'clock. After that, we will touch the clitoris gently with the cotton swab and then the perianal area. And we try to keep track of mild, moderate, severe, where it's located and what the intensity is. And that helps us know if they're getting better. But often the patient will know when they see us at the next visit. Either hopefully they say, I'm better but you can't help everyone all the time, particularly on the first return visit. So some say I'm worse. And that helps us know from the Q-tip test. Okay. So when we're talking about the Q-tip test, you're looking for sensitivities, you're looking for allodynia, you're kind of just doing that light touch in all of those areas to see where they're having the specific issues, if it's more generalized or more specific. Right. There's two types of vulvodynia, generalized and localized. Generalized is where the majority of the vulva is is involved with pain, whereas localized, there's two subcategories of localized, either clitoridinia, which is not nearly as common as the other subcategory, and that's called vestibulodynia, where the vestibule from the hymen on out to heart's line is where the pain is located, and that's localized. And when you're looking at vulvodynia, of course, there are all sorts of different categories that can be causing that vulvodynia, as vulvodynia is a a symptom, not necessarily a diagnosis. So how do you start to sort of group people into, you know, what might be more infectious, what might be more inflammatory, what might be more neurologic? How, How do you kind of move forward in that area? Well, the majority of the new patients get a yeast culture. We identify the species and then Depending on what the species is, if it's positive, we treat appropriately. There's actually an iPhone app out there that the ISSVD put out that tells you based on the species type, what agents it's likely to respond to. We rarely ever do sensitivities to yeast on rare occasion if they're not better on what we already think it's going to be sensitive to. So if their pain goes away with an antifungal, that's great. They didn't have vulvodynia to begin with. They had vulvar pain secondary to the yeast infection. But if their pain doesn't get better, we start them on all different things. If the vulva looks normal, we're going to start them on some topical compounded medicines. Or if they haven't tried 5% lidocaine ointment, we'll try that. If it's generalized, you still can use some of the topicals. But if it's severe and generalized, I'll often go to the oral 
medications, the oral tricyclic antidepressants, the oral anticonvulsants. And then you mentioned, I believe, physical therapy. I I find physical therapy extremely helpful for localized vulvodynia as well as some generalized vulvodynia. If it's localized and they haven't gotten better, we do do some Botox injections in our clinic. We tend to do them with mild sedation. And then if that fails, we will do vestibulectomies with vaginal advancement. But often the other measures now work. When we first open our Center for Vulvar Diseases, I would say the majority of time we would be doing maybe 100 vestibulectomies in a year. And now it's at most five or 10 vestibulectomies in a year because other things are working. Okay, so the vestibulectomy is kind of like the the last resort if everything else isn't working. What are the kind of go-to topicals that you use or that you compound? I use 2% amitriptyline, 6% gabapentin, 2% baclofen in a water washable base frequently. You can add ketamine if needed, or you can subtract one of those and add other agents. But those are that's my general one. At times, people are actually sensitive to the base, so the compounding pharmacists are great. They'll often send four bases to the patient if they've had problems before with bases, and then let them figure out what they're going to mix those agents with. I find that's really helpful with a, a good compounding pharmacist who will give the samples to the patient. It makes a world of difference so that you can know like what is it they're sensitive to and what are they tolerating. It's really helpful. Most definitely. So you're using a little bit more of those sort of neurologic medications and muscle relaxers in your compounding. Do you ever add any hormones in or, or any steroids in at that point? Sure. We had talked earlier about the menopausal or perimenopausal patient. Yes, we will. But I sometimes keep it separate just because sometimes they're using these compounded medications up to three times a day. And so you want to be able to figure out the amount of estrogen they're actually getting and not go too high on the dosing. But you can compound estrogen with any of those agents. So with the vulvodynia, you have a pretty straightforward approach of kind of trying to figure out where it's coming from, if the topicals are working, if a more systemic medication is working, ruling out infections, of course, and then a kind of last case resort, vestibulectomy, if the physical therapy and the medications haven't worked. In terms of the vestibulectomy, are you seeing pretty high success rates with your patients? I would say our success rate is probably at the 65% to 70% success rate. If you look at the literature, a lot of places are quoting similar, anywhere from 60 to 70%. Some places are quoting 90%, 95% success rates. When I've actually pulled some of the articles, though, that is at times not a long study, the questionnaire was given shortly after surgery, whereas we've had patients that have gotten better and then three years later, five years later, had pain come back. So you have to look at all those studies to see. And the other thing is some people do go straight to surgery. It's not what I recommend, but there are vulvar specialists that say go right to surgery. Don't bother with anything else. And they say they have high success rates. I wonder though, if they're operating on them early on, if some of the other agents I mentioned might have taken care of it, whereas we're operating on the patient that has failed all the things I've mentioned, so less likely to be successful. Right. And and sometimes, yeah, sometimes those are the patients that are pretty much nothing is really working for, and that can be very frustrating. And of course, patients sometimes get frustrated with having sort of a long-term approach with these other areas. But I found so many patients have come to me after they've had sometimes one or two even vestibulectomies and really haven't gotten long-term relief. And then you're in a little bit of a difficult situation because they've got the scar tissue in addition to the other causes of their, their vulvodynia. And it can be a little bit more tricky to, to deal with there. And, and maybe those patients just weren't getting the long-term follow-up in those success rates. It's, it's hard to know for sure. We were traditionally taught that the vestibulectomy made the diameter bigger of the entranceway, but to be honest, it doesn't in a lot of our patients, particularly the nulla patient. So what we found in order to get the diameter large enough, first of all, they need to be educated on dilators to use starting eight weeks out from the surgery if needed. And the second thing I do is if the pain is 
up towards the urethra as well. I mean, almost always it's on the lower part between the, in lithotomy, the three and nine o'clock positions. But if it goes up between nine and 12 o'clock or three and 12 o'clock, we do a vestibulectomy of the area. We make like an upside, we make a U. And then we do V to Ys on the superior part from the inner labium minus on each side. And that makes a larger entranceway diameter. Okay. Now that's an interesting approach because, yeah, if you're doing such a large area, sometimes that can be a problem if you're not making that approach. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that that's working well for you. So kind of moving on from the vulvodynia side of things, you mentioned that a lot of the patients that you're seeing now have lichen sclerosis. And I think this is an area where a lot of, of gynecologists can struggle too, is making that diagnosis and treating the lichen sclerosis. So tell me a little bit more about kind of what features, what signs and symptoms you're looking for here, when you would get a biopsy, and, and how you start that process. When we first started our Center for Vulvar Diseases, we were taught from the experts that you should biopsy to prove it's lichen sclerosis, but that's really gone by the wayside. If they have the classic appearance of lichen sclerosis, they don't have erosions, they don't have any tissue that's thickened, anything concerning for a pre-cancer or cancer, then, then you don't need to biopsy it to prove it. If you place them on treatment and they're not feeling any better, then yeah, go ahead and think about doing a biopsy, maybe you have the wrong diagnosis. We do biopsy those that were at all concerned about differentiated vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia or cancer. I have found a classic presentation of the lichen sclerosis cancer patient, though. We've had three or four patients that you walk in the room, they're standing up, and you say, would you like to sit down? And they say, I can't sit down. It hurts too much. They've had multiple biopsies. They don't show anything but lichen sclerosis or some, one patient, actually, they thought she had Crohn's disease. And when they finally were able to lie down and be examined and we touch the vulva, we feel hardness and firmness and you biopsy that area and they have cancer. So if someone's got excruciating pain and something hard and firm, Obviously, you've got a biopsy to see if it's a cancer. Up to 5% of patients with lichen sclerosis develop a squamous cell carcinoma. And definitely the, the pain is a good sort of tip off. But just like you've noticed, I feel like the couple of patients that I've had where the biopsy has come back cancer when we've been, you know, watching their lichen sclerosis is when they have that kind of area that's a little bit firmer, maybe a little bit thicker instead of that kind of thin area. So really important that they're getting examined on a regular basis and being followed up and biopsying for any, any newer abnormal areas. And put touch into the examination when you're seeing them. Touch the area. Make sure that you are biopsying the area that is firm and painful. I mean, I don't want to sound mean. Obviously, it's painful to do the biopsy. We'll put some topical lidocaine on first and We'll cover it with some saran wrap, and then we'll inject it with a lidocaine with epinephrine, dependent on the area it is in the vulva. Right. Trying to make it as comfortable as possible. But it's so easy to be persuaded, I think, from patients who are in a lot of pain to avoid the exam. And I know many times they don't want, but I, I do think it's important that we convince people to be examined and biopsied if, if needed and, and give them as many comfort measures as we can to make that process a little bit easier. There are times we've had to take them to the operating room to do the biopsies because they're so uncomfortable. We certainly don't want to torture the patient, but if you can do it in the clinic with the measures I spoke, it's it's much better because you get a faster diagnosis and can get them in with the gynecologic oncology surgery division. Now, of course, on the other side of that, where most lichen sclerosis is, are, are not going to turn into cancer, even though, of course, cancer is more common when somebody has lichen sclerosis. So how do you set about treating your lichen sclerosis? What do you start with? So I generally look at the vulva, and if it's fairly advanced, I will go with a class one steroid ointment. I prefer ointments. They have less additives. They are tolerated better than the creams by most patients. So we'll use clobetazole ointment nightly for three months. Sometimes if it's really 
got some thickening like lichen simplex chronicus along with the lichen sclerosis. I'll use it twice a day for a month and nightly for two months. Then you have the option. You can either go to three times a week with the clobetazole ointment versus going to a nightly mid-dose steroid ointment. And we use Trium Cinolona 79.1% ointment. There's a list of the classes with class one being the strongest, class seven, the weakest. And so you can use any of the ones in class four on a nightly basis. And sometimes I'll try to get to a class five, but we just picked Trium Cinolone 0.1%. There's any one that you can use. And actually some patients have a reaction to various topical steroids. It's hard to imagine that they're actually allergic to a steroid. I usually thought it was the base, but I learned from an allergist years ago, there's different types of steroid allergies. So say someone can't tolerate the triamcinolone, you can look at the steroid allergy list and pick one from a different category that they might be able to tolerate. That's interesting. I hadn't heard that before. So I like that they're, they have the categories so you can kind of pick which, which area that might be better tolerated for somebody who's allergic. It's A, B, C, D1, D2, and we have it. We actually have on our website, a hundred, it's up to 175 pages now handout that that's in and the classes of steroids are in and the various treatments for the various diseases. It's a lecture we give called Your Diagnosis Is, but it really talks about the majority of the vulvar conditions we see and how to treat them. So you're saying with the lower class steroids, you can use them nightly. And then with those higher ones, you set up to three times a week. And of course, this is always the question is, you know, how long can we use steroids? So in general, for somebody who needs like a long-term maintenance or care with the lichen sclerosis, how long are you comfortable with using something like clobetazole if you're spacing it out by like the two or three times a week? For the rest of their life, it's very safe. A lot of people say, oh, I was told it's going to thin my skin out. It's it's the disease. It's the lichen sclerosis that's doing it. it. It's not the steroid. Have I seen complications from steroids? Yeah. I've seen steroid overuse, but that's a bright red vulva, not loss of the labia minora and clitoral scarring. We actually teach our lichen sclerosis patients to lift back on the hood of the clitoris on a daily basis to prevent scarring. We've never proven it, but I, I do see patients come in with complete scarring, and whereas ones we found early enough aren't getting the scarring. So I do think it's helpful. And for the patients who aren't really responding to the clobetazole, of course, you mentioned that maybe that would be a time that you would biopsy so that you can you know, confirm that it is the diagnosis. If, if that's happened, if you've confirmed it's lichen sclerosis and they're not responding to clobetazole, what's your next step? So you can use tacrolimus but it can be irritating on the vulva. Then there's other things you can use, and that's where we send them to the dermatologist. So for the lichens, particularly, we haven't talked about lichen plainness, but they use methotrexate sometimes for that. Some of the other immunosuppressants that you can use that as a gynecologist, we, we tend to not use. We let the dermatologist manage that. Okay, so using some of these other immunosuppressant therapies. Every now and then I get one of those patients, it's like, I've tried everything. We try clobetazole, we try tacrolimus, we try some over-the-counter moisturizers and vaginal estrogens, and they're still not quite feeling their best. Do you have any tips for those people? Sure. Often what's bothering them is that they're itching. So if they're itching, we have other regimens we use. So we have a whole itch, scratch, itch regimen. It's at least eight steps, but we start them on either oral prednisone or any other oral steroid you'd want to use. But we use prednisone, 40 milligrams a day for five days. They take it in the morning and then 20 milligrams for 10 days. Sometimes we go even longer. And occasionally that's enough to just get it so that they are under better control. And now the topical steroid is where they want to be. Other patients that are miserable, itching, scratching, fail the prednisone, then we'll go with a injection of triamcinolone into the gluteus muscle. We use a milligram per kilogram up to a maximum of 80 milligrams into the gluteus muscle. And it works very well. It is given monthly for up to three times. On occasion, I'll give it four times. 
You don't want to use it more than four times in a year usually, but we give it monthly, three times frequently. We'll do that. And then those patients will also get on gabapentin, amitriptyline. Amitriptyline works great for itching. Hydroxyzine we'll use at times. Gabapentin works great for itching. So we have this whole itch scratch regimen that works well. That'd be interesting to see. I, I hope that maybe you can share that with with some of us or maybe we can link to it into the show notes because I think that's where a lot of people have trouble is when you've you tried kind of all the, the basic things and people still aren't quite getting better and where to start with that more systemic treatment I think is helpful. Well, I have an idea. We have a QR code that takes you to our website. If that could be made accessible, then that could be scanned and then you could see the your diagnosis is that has all these recipes or say they are more interested in reading about lichen sclerosis we have a lecture on lichen sclerosis or they have a patient with lichen simplex chronicus we have a lecture on that or high grade we have lectures on that on this website so if there's a way to get that qr to the people listening that would be great yeah i think we can definitely link to that in the show notes so so we'll definitely do that so we can have all of these resources because like you said, it's hard to to cover all of it in, in one podcast, and it's also hard to cover without some pictures and slides and, and things along those lines. So I'm sure we can get a little bit more from that with these lectures. I think that would be helpful. So in terms of some of these, you know, newer things that are under study, of course, there's studies coming out about you know, lasers and the lichen sclerosis and other, you know, potential you know, immunologic treatments. Are there any things that, that you've seen that you think look promising? Yeah, there's there's been a lot of things in the literature that have come up recently. When I think about it, some of the interventions that I find most fascinating are the studies on the vaginal microbiome, the microenvironment. Those, not my area of expertise, but they are fascinating. And I think that We're moving ahead in that. The ISSVD's secretary general has a particular interest in the microbiome. And at the next meeting, we're going to have several lectures on microbiology, microbiome, and the various vulvovaginal diseases. Other things I've found interesting are what's out there on vulvar and vaginal health. And some of it is totally wrong. Some of the things that are being proposed for women to do are incredibly wrong and are harming patients. What are the things that you see most commonly out there that you just wish nobody would ever do or that you could just, you know, put a big X over that piece of advice? Oh, offhand, I'm not a big fan of using laser vaginal rejuvenation. Having um, read all the information and debated this in detail before, I realized once uh, tissue is lasered, yes, you do get some nice glycogenated epithelium, but that's not going to last. It's going to slough off, and you're not going to be lasering multiple times every year for the rest of their life. There are indications for it. I, I can understand it. It's being used for lichen sclerosis, and I'm not convinced it's a good means for lichen sclerosis. So that's one of the things for vaginal health I've looked at and and haven't really thought was the way to go. Anything else that you would recommend avoiding altogether? I know there's, of course, a lot of crazy stuff out there on social media. You know, you see stuff about steaming. And of course, you know, douching has been like the long-term enemy of all gynecologists. Are there any new trends that you've noticed that you'd really wish people would avoid? Yeah, I'm not at all supportive of steaming. I think there's absolutely no place for that. And some of the foreign bodies that are placed into it, I'm I'm not really thinking that's good either. I think that over the counter, when you go to a pharmacy and you look at the various things for the vagina to make it smell good, and they're they're called They're not supposed to be put in the vagina, but often patients think it's for the vagina, and they're causing a lot of contact dermatitis, a lot of these over-the-counter products. And when you look at them, they have plant products in them. They have 20 ingredients, and people are getting contact dermatitis from them. 
So always important to get a good sense of what people have been using so that you can see. And, and when you see that really like inflamed, uncomfortable looking area to the vulva and the vagina, it may just be a contact dermatitis from these products that people think are safe because they're over the counter, right? Correct. There's uh, one in particular that has benzocaine in it. And we've seen several patients that are using multiple applications of the product that with, has benzocaine in it. And they're getting raised areas with central erosions. At first, I thought it looked like molluscum contagiosum when I saw my first patient with it. But it is more compatible with uh, lichen simplex chronicus where you biopsy it. And they are, are thinking that is what's going to cure their vulvar vaginal irritation. And it's actually making it a lot worse. I've had to admit one patient in to get off of those products. She was using seven tubes a day of a product with benzocaine in it. And we had to actually get her on a psych ward because she was suicidal and work with her, getting her on other appropriate medications to get off of that. So sorry to hear that. In general, you're right. We should always look into what's coming into these products and see what it is that people are using. And there are so many different things out there that it can be a little crazy. And then when you start to see things like you just described, it makes us start looking for these you know, less common things like molluscum. Not that that's uncommon in general, but looking for you know molluscum or pemphigus vulgarum or like all of these sort of like less likely things are looking at Crohn's. So when, when we're looking at the like sort of less common things out there, do you have an approach to how you start to kind of rein things in when, when it's not such a common symptoms like a lichen sclerosis or a typical vulvodynia? Well, um, before we get to that, I think when we're talking about precancers, something new that's out there, and actually it's been done for many years, but there is a new anal precancer cancer guideline that came out from the International Anal Neoplasia Society, Ian's it's called. And this came out just this year. And as many as us are gynecologists and we're doing vulvoscopies for high grade of the vulva, I think we have to think about the anus and do anal cytology. If you have someone that's willing to do an anoscopy then and go ahead and treat if you find high grade of the anus and also the HPV vaccine with use of the precancers. We're finding some good results with using that in this population. Obviously, the high grade is decreasing as well as the use in patients that have high grade already. We're actually giving HPV vaccine to some of the patients that are over 45 to try to help with getting a cure. And are you doing the anoscopy and sampling yourself, the cytology? Or are you sending them to a GI or how are you how are you arranging that? So I think us as gynecologists that do colposcopy and have been trained in colposcopy are very capable of doing anoscopes once you learn the procedure. And the Ian's does have a course where they teach anoscopy. It's a very good course. They have a basic one and an advanced one. We do it. All of the providers in our clinic have been trained on it. And if they see something on cytology, we we actually use the ASCCP guidelines up to this point because our population isn't HIV positive like some of the earlier literature from Ian's. Although we're going to compare our rates of high grade, low grade in patients with H cell of the vulva, high grade, low grade of the anus, and compare it to some of the studies that Ian's has done. We actually have a study we're doing right now on that and see whether we can really, we're, we're not screening quite as frequently as the new recommendations for from Ian's says to do, but we're going to look because I think we have a lower risk population with our women that have HPV of the vulva that is high grade. We don't have a lot of IV drug abusers. We obviously don't have the men who have sex with men population. So we're looking at that. Hopefully that study will be out in the next year. 
Very interesting. Yeah, I think it's important to to look at all of those areas. And of course, as as gynecologists, we should learn how to do the, that as well, because we're sometimes the only people who are examining people in that area in general. So that's a very good tip. I love everything that you've shared with us so far. I think it's been really eye opening. I wanted to ask just, you know, what is it that you think that the rest of us are missing in our care of vulvar conditions? I know there's probably a lot of things on the list, but what are the the top things that you think the rest of us OBGYNs are are missing and and we could do to improve other than doing, of course, the anoscopy that you just recommended? Well, I think that sometimes the patients with vulvodynia are not treated aggressively enough. And the longer you have the vulvodynia, the worse it can get, the harder it can get to cure. So I recommend they that yeah, those of you that aren't familiar with the vulvodynia guideline from the ISSVD, ASCCP, et cetera, we've we've done a lot of work through those organizations and do the reading of the guideline and start treating those patients early on that need help with vulvodynia. Other conditions of one of my most unusual conditions that I think could benefit from more aggressive treatment is hydradenitis separativa. Hydradenitis separativa is a devastating condition. You know, it's one thing to have it in the axilla. It can be horrible. I totally understand that. But when you've got it in your groins, the vulva, and a lot of our patients have it in the buttock area too, it takes over their life. I couldn't imagine how miserable they must be. So if we could start seeing patients with furuncles or early boils of hydradenitis and start treating that appropriately, I think we could probably keep a lot of patients from going on to stage two. There's three stages of hydradenitis separativa. If you see someone in stage one and get them on the stage one medications, 75% are going to stay at that or get even better that you're not going to need medicines long term. But once they get to stage two, the medications get more difficult, the treatments get more difficult, and then once they get to stage three, and that's where a large portion of the vulva is involved, the buttocks involved, it's a surgical condition. And what we do for that are vulvectomies, part of the abdomen removal if it diseases up towards the umbilicus, and buttock removal, and wound vax and grafts sometimes flaps. I prefer the grafts. And if we could just get those stage ones on the right medicines, OCPs, if they are contraindicated ones that don't have high androgen profiles in them, if we could get them on clindamycin lotion, the appropriate cleansing bars, topical steroids if they need it. Really, steroids, though, aren't the answer for hydradenase. Occasionally, we will use intralesional steroid injections, But that's what we need to do. Keep them in stage one. And on that handout I mentioned to you, we have lots and lots of recipes for how to treat stage one, how to treat stage two, how to treat stage three. They're using a lot of Humira, adalimumab in dermatology for stage two, stage three. And I think it's great for stage two, but for stage three, In my opinion, surgery, the vulvectomy with skin grafts, wound back, and then we do a, eventually after a couple of wound back changes, we go to skin grafting with a rest on. They're in the hospital about 17, 18 days on the average. But these women are happy. They're no longer having that drainage. You do have to rule out Crohn's disease, though, because if you operate on a Crohn's patient, it's likely to come back. And for those people that you're trying to catch in stage one, how do you sort of note the differences between somebody with a very early hydradenitis superativa versus somebody who's maybe got a few boils from, you know, uh, chronic folliculitis or, um, or just other kind of boils in the area? How do you kind of put somebody into that category and get them on more aggressive treatment? If they have one small Furuncle, that's not going to be hydradenitis. But if they have multiple boils, you're at hydradenitis. And look in their armpits. Not everybody with vulvar hydradenitis has axillary hydradenitis, but I, a lot of them do. So, so look in the armpits. Look under the breast. Some women get it under their breast. 
there's actually a, a lot of hidradenitis groups. If you happen to have a patient with hidradenitis, they have a patient-developed hidradenitis separativa group that has wonderful information on it. We get them to stop smoking if they smoke. We also do that with the high-grade patients. The longer they smoke, the harder it is for us to get rid of the disease. We start the hidradenitis patients on a lot of over-the-counter things, vitamins and things. And again, that's all in our, our recipe in there. But we have to get that under control and make their life better because they are miserable. Definitely a very miserable condition for sure, as are most of these vulvar conditions. And you've really got such a wealth of knowledge that you've shared with us, Dr. Hafner. Is there anything else you'd like to leave us with before we go? Well, I think that all of you are experts already with what you've seen in clinic, most likely. I think the more you look at the vulva, the more you read about it, the more you look at pictures of diseases, you too can start seeing some of these rarer conditions and diagnosing them. And the women the women need your help. So if you have an interest in it, come, come and look at the website that I've mentioned. Come to some of the ISSVD meetings if you're interested. We have a meeting every other year. So the next one's in Chicago in 2025 in September. And there's so much information to share. And we learn a lot from the providers when they bring their interesting cases that we sit and discuss and debate. Sometimes some of the most unusual conditions are diagnosed there. And, and some of us that are experts haven't even seen those conditions. Definitely very interesting. So we will link to that website in the show notes and make sure that everybody can get into more of this wonderful information that you have to share. Thank you so much, Dr. Hope Abner. It's been a pleasure talking with you. You're welcome. Thank you for talking with me. Have a good day. You too. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to follow the podcast, rate it five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable OBGYN on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable OBGYN is hosted by myself, Mark Hoffman, and Amy Park. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bolf, Nick Shellcross, Josh Spencer. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Taylor's version Hess and Yvonne Orvijinski. Show notes and social media by Emma Landenwich and Lindsay Beecham. Administrative support provided by Jim Lloyd Kennebrew. Music written and performed by Scott Baby Daddy Hoffman. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next time. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts and guests on Backtable OBGYN are their own and do not reflect the views or positions of their employers or any entities they represent.